Hey, welcome back to that 70s car. We're in a car from the 60s. This is a 1969 Plymouth Valiant. This boxy little thing is the latest addition to my collection, and it has as many options as a Soviet election. No air conditioning, no radio, no power locks, no power windows, no power brakes, and a slant six motor that has more cast iron in it than your average Hyundai. And that's part of what makes it the coolest Econobox ever. Back when this car was new, it was about $2,300, $2,300. In today's money, that's about $14,000. Now, $14,000 uh, still buys your car these days, strangely enough, but uh, what does it buy? A Hyundai Accent or a Chevrolet Spark? Oh! Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really want a Chevrolet Spark or you want this? This, obviously. This was a great car back in its day, and it's still a great car now. You know, for years, the Valiant dominated the marketplace as one of the best economy cars that you could possibly buy. I mean, of course, its competition to Chevy Nova and the Ford Falcon were good as well, but uh, all the reviewers loved the Valiant. They even had one starring film role in Steven Spielberg's first feature film, Duel, with Dennis Weaver. And under the hood is this little brilliant motor of Chrysler's, the Slant 6. Now, it's not like an inline six that sits straight up. This thing literally sits at almost a 45 degree angle and it's got solid lifters, so it does sound like a tractor. You know, it's everything that makes Mopar muscle car elitists go blech. And you know, that's a good enough reason to own this car to start with. I just love making them drop their build sheets when they realize this car has four doors. Why, you mean you didn't part it out? 40 year old account of box? No, I didn't part it out. And that's part of the beauty of it. It's got 22,000 original miles on the clock. It's beautiful and I love driving it. So you know what? It's staying as a four-door. And so you see, while well, the Mopar muscle car leaders are having absolutely sleepless nights worrying whether the water pump pulley has the correct part number on it for the numbers matching restoration, I'm driving this car and enjoying the living daylights out of it. Ha 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 ha! Evil laugh, maniacal laugh, maniacal laugh. Oh, and since it's an unrestored car, the water pump pulley has the correct part number on it. <laughs> yeah, ice cream. Now, by now, you're probably thinking this is the most indestructible car in the world. Absolutely perfect, nothing ever goes wrong with it. It's excellent, right? Mm, something like that. But when I first got the car, I had to do the master cylinder and the alternator, and this is about how it was. Now, the only problem with having a lot of tools is when they're about 5,000 miles away from the car. You know, a wise man once said you can never have enough tools. Well, a wiser man said, get the place to put the tools before you have too many tools. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Unfortunately, that brand new master cylinder wouldn't bench bleed properly no matter what I did to it. See this? Made by Cardone. Junk. And it stayed junk to the end when I pulled it out. The new master cylinder's brake piston had separated from the cylinder board due to the retainer tab bending out of place. So, um, it's to the auto parts store we go. In a Kia. <laughs> And sure enough, there wasn't an auto parts store in town that had one. However, this was a good thing because I wound up going online and getting a version for a 1973 Valiant that had a clip style cap and is much easier to service. So all we have to do is wait for the alternator to arrive and hope it works.
1969 Plymouth Valiant 3.7 belt drive. Fan and alternator, alternator and fan belt, high capacity V belts, part 9530, also uh, known as uh, air conditioning. So. Well, we'll see what it does. Ah, beautiful. Now, I'm not saying this car is absolutely perfect. One of the last things that I have to do to it, and I still haven't done with it, and is the main problem, and maybe you can help me on it, just like the A-Team, is that this car has 13-inch rims, not 14s. And that means that the available tires for this car are virtually nil. And the tires that are on it right now that I got it with are way too small. So the caster, camber, and front end alignment is completely off. And when I turn the car, it does not really want to steer itself back straight, just like that. This is the original 13 inch rim on the Valiant. And this is the original tire. This is a Biosply 13 inch tire. And as you can see, it's a lot taller than the radial behind me. Now, unfortunately, modern radials don't come in a size equivalent to this. And what's more is that there's about the width of a pizza cutter. So, now the problem is not only can't you get a 13 inch uh, tire that approximates the size of the original Biosplies, these are very narrow tires, and I'd like to get something a little bit wider. There's a problem, though. This car rides on something called a Mopar small bolt pattern rim. Five lugs on a four-inch bolt circle, which is not how the rest of the world, or even large Mopars, were designed. They used five lugs on a four-and-a-half-inch bolt circle, known as the Mopar large bolt pattern. And as you can see, they also came really nice and wide. This one's a seven-inch rim. Now, obviously, that can't bolt directly up to this. However, the Valiants and the Dodge Cousin to Dart between 1973 and 1976 were made in large bolt patterns. So in theory, stock parts can be used to convert this car to the large bolt pattern so I can run some rims like this. However, this requires replacing the spindle, which the hub sits on, and the upper control arm, and that's just for the front. Let's take a look at the back. Now buried under there is a Chrysler seven and a quarter inch rear axle. And all you need to know about that is that its durability is about as follows. I can get a seven and a quarter inch large bolt pattern rear axle. And if worse comes to worse, I'll have to do that. Just the same, if I do a eight and a quarter inch rear axle, which would be a good upgrade for the car, the drive shaft has to be shortened. Personally, I got sick of this. So I went ahead on Craigslist to see if I could find some small bolt pattern rims. Fella said he had some, and a car. As if I didn't have enough problems, I got myself a stable mate for the Valiant in the form of a 1968 Plymouth Satellite. This car is the brainchild of someone who detrimmed it into a Belvedere and tried to make it look like a City of Miami police car, and instead somehow got some LAPD and California Highway Patrol mixed in. Whatever the case, as a big fan of the show Adam 12, I'll take it any which way, and I threw that California license plate up front. And so I was perfectly happy. Right until the point that I realized that the previous owner had taken the muffler and tailpipe off, not because they were rusty, but because the engine had three burnt valves. Oh yeah, just needed a little carb tuning, right? Uh-uh. Under the hood sat the original Chrysler 318 for this car. The 318 isn't a bad motor at all, even though it's not really performance oriented, but this one had had it. The cost of rebuilding the 318 really didn't make sense given its value and operational shape, and I knew that Chrysler had made versions of these engines all the way into 2003. So I figured, why not make this a fun weekend project?
Today we're here at the junkyard and we're scouting for a Magnum 5.2 or 5.9 for the satellite. Now, I can always buy a vehicle off of Craigslist, but uh, down here, you can't find it that cheap. The Magnums are common in junkyards due to the relatively recent production run, but I had a problem. The base Magnum motor is an anemic six-cylinder version of the eight-cylinder 318 and apparently all the cars in the junkyard were owned by cheapskates who didn't care enough for this engine upgrade. 3.9. 3.9. And then I caught sight of something promising. This 1989 Dodge B350 camper conversion predated the Magnum engines, but it had a big old 360 block in it that looked pretty good. So I came back the next week with 30 pounds of tools and a battery and proceeded to test compression. Okay, we've taken everything off the front of the engine and I've brought the main battery cables here to the back and also starting solenoid cables, so uh, we should be ready to take a compression test in a minute. Good on one. Success. It turned out this van had a very healthy motor and it was super clean inside. And with that ascertained, let's try to see if we can actually get the thing out of the van. Before long, I had the 360 torn down for inspection, and it was so utterly clean inside that I didn't even venture to mess with the bottom end other than to fit a new ear seal and center sump oil pickup and pan. I did, however, score a pair of Magnum closed chamber cylinder heads on Craigslist to get a slight improvement in flow and compression ratio. And since the deck surfaces checked out, I went straight for installing new head gaskets and started reassembling the motor with the later Magnum heads. At this point, there was only one thing for sure. It was time for the original 318 to go. And with an unwilling wheeze, it started up for the last time and promptly shut off. With the Mustang project moved out of the way, the satellite was driven into the operating room and the transplant commenced.
While it only took three days to pull the old 318 out and dump the 360 in, it took weeks to fit the engine bay with new, rebuilt, or otherwise different doodads. New transmission cooler lines were installed to replace the originals, which had been patched with hose, amongst other high-quality repairs done by previous mechanics. Hmm, look at that. Precision engineering. This is one of the party pieces of our build. These are exhaust manifolds from a 1992 or 1993 Magnum engine, and they have a really large exhaust port at the back here, and they flow really well, so they should give us a little bit of extra horsepower. To make sure all my effort in getting these fancy Magnum exhaust manifolds was completely wasted, I booger welded the worst looking 2.5 inch dual exhaust system that this car has ever seen but I'll have to say it's still better than the rusty drain pipe that was falling off the car before. The satellite Sagnaw steering pump was also rebuilt using spares from a few other pumps, but it proved to be a bit of a problem on initial startup, as I'd installed a cam ring reversed. A quick evening fix took care of the problem. And the original engine? Well, let's just say it's no longer with us. As close as it felt to completion, there was a major problem with the new engine, namely, the lifters were clattering beyond belief. I had the painful job of disassembling the top end all over again to find out what the problem was. After some forensics, it turned out that the original roller cam LA lifters were never designed to oil the rocker arms through the push rod, and thus sent oil straight through the lifter and let into the bore and out the center of the push rod seat. This might have been okay with solid push rods or the original rockers. That would have created back pressure against a push rod seat to build oil pressure and help keep the lifters pumped. It became clear that the Magnum lifters had been redesigned to meter oil through their push rod seat, thus keeping the necessary oil back pressure for engine operation. In fact, the Magnum lifters are now the de facto norm at parts stores if you order a lifter for the earlier Rollercam LA engine as well. Plus, there's some unsubstantiated discussion online that the earlier design was flawed and recalled to begin with. After 16 new lifters were installed, the problem vanished. From then on, it was just the little details that had to be taken care of, such as four broken springs on the bench seat. With some help from the Mopar forums online, namely for bbodiesonly.com, I was able to get a set of replacements and refoam the seat. This was also my opportunity to patch up one lone hole in the floor pan. Uh, some protection here for my mouth because we're gonna make a mess. Mostly over me. And since the bench was out and the floor pan had just been fixed, I decided to install sound deadening while I was at it. As a matter of fact, lots of sound deadening. But once I finally got the car on the road, its acceleration really wasn't what I expected out of the big Mopar 360. Let's see here. We got a whole lot of expensive test equipment there. And by expensive, I mean one iPhone and a tachometer that for some reason doesn't work right. And uh, we're gonna go on a test drive that probably proves absolutely nothing. For whatever reason, and I think it's because of the 2.76 to 1 ratio gears that are in the back of the satellite. The satellite drives like an absolute pig. Mm. All that effort. 
the molasses-like acceleration was hardly the first problem. The very first test drive was met with a horrible chattering from the rear end, which turned out to be the left rear brake shoe dragging, as the brand new pads were not radiused with the old drums on the car. And while I was in there, I also adjusted the axle end play as a precaution. The engine runs pretty good though. I, I also serviced the brakes. The brakes don't do all that well. I'm braking from about 65 miles an hour down to 40. Believe me, that uh, particular drum on the front right really digs in rather not so confidently. Brake pedal's absolutely terrible. I think there's one of the bushings I think is gone in there. And it, when you apply it, it goes. <laughs> Ugh. Plus the suspension is crap. <laughs> and that's for another episode. But I got most of the parts sitting around for it. It's a lot of fun to drive this car, to tell you the truth. Even though the alignment's all screwy, it pulls to the left and such. Drum brake wants to kill you. I love it. <laughs> Ultimately, the acceleration was simply a case of the tall 2.76 to 1 highway gear zapping up torque on initial acceleration. But acceleration from 35 miles an hour on up, though, was all you could ever want and then some. And so it's the eternal project car. Who cares? You know what they say about learning how to get it right by getting it wrong? Well, for whatever I didn't get wrong, the previous mechanic did. And so it's been a learning experience past my wildest dreams. But what a feeling when you've taken a neglected project car out of its cave and made it roadworthy. Uh, all right, barely roadworthy. With your own two hands. We'll see you next time on That 70s Car. What is that awful? Oh, a Kia!